Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to the second session of Resistance School. We uh, here at Resistance School are so fired up, now more than ever, to help you reclaim, rebuild, and reimagine America. Resistance School wants to equip you and all of the communities that you represent with the necessary skills to mobilize and organize around progressive values and to create and sustain change. This fall, Resistance School will focus on teaching you leadership skills. We base this semester's trainings on a framework of social movement leadership as exercised through narrative, relationship building, strategy, structure, and action. Each of our four fall sessions will provide you with some additional resources, such as readings, interactive homework, and simplified tip sheets to get you started and practice these skills a little bit more at home. So for tonight's session, we are honored to have Professor Marshall Gans here with us to teach us the skill of public narrative <laughs> and the importance it plays in helping to motivate people around one common goal. Public narrative helps us use moral resources like courage and interpersonal connections to make choices that shape our identities as individuals, as communities, and as nations. And now before we get started, I'll share a little of Professor Marshall Gans's personal narrative. Professor Gans grew up in Bakersfield, California, where his father was a rabbi and his mother a teacher. He entered Harvard College in the fall of 1960, but left a year before graduating to follow his calling as, as an organizer. Gans joined Cesar Chavez in his effort to unionize California farm workers, and he eventually became the director of organizing for United Farm Workers. After working for many years with grassroots groups and developing new organizing and voter mobilization strategies, he finally returned to Harvard after a 28-year-long leave of absence to complete his undergrad degree. Professor Gans now has a Master in Public Administration from the Kennedy School and was awarded a PhD in Sociology in 2000. Currently, as a senior lecturer in public policy, Professor Gans teaches, researches, and writes on leadership, organization, strategy, and public narrative. We are beyond grateful to have such a renowned academic and practitioner teach us today. Uh, good evening. Well, that was very feeble. Good evening. Good evening. All right, much better. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, work with you uh, this evening on the role of leadership uh, narrative and the role of narrative in organizing what I call public narrative story of self, story of us, story of now. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the Resistance School, uh, in particular the folks that worked on this session, uh, Cecily Tyler, uh, Clarice Chang, uh, Connor Han, Sarah El Rahib, Kate O'Gorman, Rosie Greenberg, Chuck Herman, Isabel Farrington, Jason Margasa, and Dan Isola, as well as the participants in the video that you'll, uh, you'll be seeing, uh, Anita Krishnan, uh, Angeli Rodriguez, uh, Jeff Rousset, Rosie Greenberg, and again, Sarah El Rahel. Okay. Now, this is the beginning of a learning process, not the end. Um, it's a process uh, of continued reflection on practice that can sustain learning. So the approach we're taking tonight is a work in progress. Uh, and it's, an, it's certainly not the only way to uh, use narrative. It's not the only way to do leadership or organizing. Uh, but it is a scaffolding that we found useful in a variety of cultural and political and institutional settings, uh, but is always subject to adaptation, change, and learning. Now, the basic approach, oh, and I need to do this. Yes. Let me see if I'm, oh. Oh, welcome. <laughs> okay, we did that. All right, good. We're ahead of time. All right. Yeah, so our goals. Uh, for this evening. First is to introduce the leadership practice of public narrative. Uh, learn something about how it works. Uh, we'll observe models uh, and then actually learn how to do it and how to coach it. And that's what we are, uh, that's our plan. Now, this approach to public narrative is based on an approach to leadership. And so I want to be explicit about that to begin with because leadership is one of those words that can mean many, many things. The approach that I take 
is rooted in three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who when asked, uh, how do I figure out what to do in the world, uh, responded with three questions to ask yourself. And the first question was, uh, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Not a selfish question, but a self-regarding question. In other words, if you presume to take responsibility for leadership, you better be clear about what's in it for you, what you expect from it, what you bring to it, uh, and, uh, and uh, what it's about. Um, but the second question he says to ask yourself is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what is to recognize that we exist in this world in relationship with others. And our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably wrapped up from, with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? I don't think it's advice to jump off a bridge. Uh, it is a caution against what Jane Addams described as the snare of preparation. Uh, just another year of strategic planning and finally we'll have the perfect plan and then we'll do it and the world will totally conform to our plan. Is that what happens? No, I've never seen it happen. Or I just need another degree and finally I'll be ready to face the world. Well, some of that around here. Uh, <laughs> the point is that, that, the point of this is that rarely can, you, can we learn to do well what we hope to do until we actually begin to do it. In other words, understanding flows from action. It does not precede it. And we can get stuck wanting to have the perfect plan, but of course, that's not how the world works. So for me, leadership is about the interaction of these three, of these three elements, self, other, and action. And it's also important that, um, that Hillel is not the answer man. Um, these are questions questions that he poses and it's appropriate because if you think about what the domain of leadership is, um, is it your experience that when everything is going great, uh, people, uh, you know, people are all excited about, oh, let's go tell the leadership so we can thank them? When do people say who's in charge here? It's yeah, it's a problem, right? And so it, it, it's understanding the domain of leadership is not certainty, it's uncertainty. It's, it's the ambiguous, it's the contradictory, it's the problems. That's, that's when the adaptive capacity for leadership really matters. And that's pretty challenging in itself because you sort of ask yourself certain questions. Do I have the skills I need uh, to deal with this new challenge, the challenge to the hands? Uh, can I use my resources in new ways to achieve my purposes? Um, a strategic challenge to the head. Uh, and then there's the question of, uh, where do I get the courage, uh, the hopefulness? How do I inspire the courage and hopefulness in others to take the risks involved in actually dealing with serious challenges? And that's a challenge to the heart. So it's a way of thinking of leadership in a head, hands, heart way. And this evening, we're going to focus particularly on the heart dimension. So much work on leadership is done on the head and hands that we do strategy and skills, but we forget about the motivational component, which is in many ways more foundational to the whole thing. So the definition of leadership that, um, that we're gonna use is that it's about accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. So this is not an idea of leadership as diva, right? or leadership as sun, and if you get close, you get warm, or you get heat, or burned, or whatever happens when you get too close. Uh, it's not that. It is leadership as a form of, in, of social interaction around shared purpose, under conditions of uncertainty, and that's how we're going to approach it. Now, organizing is a particular form of leadership that begins by asking the question, who are my people? Who is my constituency? Who, who is my community? Who are the people with whom I'm engaging in a leadership relationship? Because it's a relational understanding of leadership. It's not leadership as performance, it's leadership as relationship, as engagement. And what are the problems that they face from their lived experience, from their perspective? What is the change they need? And thirdly, how can I work with them to enable them 
to turn their resources into the power they need to achieve that change. And so it's not, it is based on the idea of constituency. So this is not leadership, as, this is not uh, providing services to grateful clients. This is not marketing products to customers who will pay for those products. It's about enabling people to come together and form a constituency, which comes from the Latin constare, which means to stand together. To bring people together, to stand together, learn together, decide together, act together, and win together. So that's what organizing is about. And the way in which we have come to uh, have come to invite people to learning the fundamental practices involved in organizing is this. In order to work with a constituency to turn its resources into the power it needs to achieve its goals, there's five practices on which we focus. Uh, the first is how to access the emotional capacity for the courage that it takes to respond as opposed to react to threats through the use of narrative. Second is building relationships, the relational foundation of, uh, of organizing. Uh, not exchanges, but relationships based on shared values and interests and so forth. Third is shared structure. And we did a session with Resistance School uh, last spring on how to launch a leadership structure. Um, fourth is shared strategy. How to turn what you have into what you need to get what you want. Also important, and finally is action how to take strategy off the drawing boards and put it into action and reality with facts on the ground and actually changing the world. So tonight, what we're gonna focus on is the first of those practices, the power of shared story. Now, that's a bicycle. <laughs> What's it doing there? You know, how you learn practice how many people have learned how to ride a bicycle? Uh, did you learn by studying bicycleology? <laughs> or, or, or social media? Or somebody gave a great, did a great video? What'd you have to do? Now, what's the first thing that happened? All right, that was your moment of truth. Then you went home, went to bed, or you found the courage to get back up on the bike, knowing that you were going to keep falling for a while because it's the only way you can learn to keep your balance, isn't it? And in my experience, that's how we learn any practice. We got to find the courage to get on the bike, knowing we're going to fall for a while, in order to begin to keep our practice. And so the pedagogy that we take in teaching these practices is to explain, to model, then practice, and then debrief. So that, that the whole picture, the conceptual, but also the practical, is there. And uh, it's really an exercise in what Carol Dweck calls growth mindset as opposed to fixed mindset. When she teaches about fixed mindset, she says it's when we experience a critical feedback on our performance, on what we're doing, as a judgment of us as a person, like you are smart or you are dumb. That's what she calls fixed mindset, and we tend to respond very defensively. But if we receive critical feedback on what we're doing on performance, uh, as data about what we have to learn, that's what she calls growth mindset. And so getting into a growth mindset is essential for learning any kind of skills and practices so we can receive affirmation but also critique as data on the learning that we need to do. Uh, it's also in, in the Zen tradition, it's called uh, Shoshin, uh, approaching things with a beginner's mind, a fresh mind, free of assumptions, engaging and ready to learn. Now, and, and what we will be doing, I should say, is that at the conclusion of this uh, session, well, no, in the later part of this session, uh, we'll get about as close to practice as we can. And for those who, well, and then afterwards, uh, after we finish this video part, uh, then we'll have some practice right here, right now, tonight. Because uh, my sense is that unless people try this, you don't get it. Uh, it just doesn't work, so we're going to do that. Now, why public narrative? So these three questions that form the basis of public narrative, got to remember to do that. Uh, these three questions that form the basis of public narrative 
uh, were sure not invented uh, at, uh, at the Kennedy School, not even at Harvard, shocking as that might be. Um, that's supposed to be funny, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the first time that I've come across them are in the book of Exodus, chapter 8. Um, and uh, Moses, I've always been interested in Moses' character because he's, he's a Jew who's an Egyptian. He's of the oppressed, but raised in the house of the oppressor. And when he realizes that complex identity, all the tensions in that, he has a hard time handling it. He kills somebody, his rage takes over. Then he goes off into the desert, which is where you go in the Bible to figure stuff out. And he finds a spouse, and he finds a father-in-law, and he finds a job, and he becomes a shepherd. And one day he's walking his sheep along <coughs> the road, and he sees a glow off the side of the road. And he's a curious fellow, so he steps off the road to see what this is, and he sees it's a bush, and this bush is burning, and it's not consumed, and that's where he hears the voice, Moses, or Moses, it's unclear. There's some <laughs> theological contention about exactly what the tone of the voice was. You, you are called to free your people. And for those familiar with the text, what's his reaction? What's his reaction, sign me up? No, why me? You got the wrong guy. I can't even give a speech, right? I have a speech impediment, you got the wrong guy. And then, wait a second, who are you? And who are these people? And third question, couldn't this wait a little bit? And that's when God negotiates with him, a staff and his brother's going to help. And so the point is that these three questions have been around for a long time. And I've yet to find a cultural context in, in where people don't ask themselves these questions. Now, they have different answers, but the questions are fundamental. The first time I asked myself these questions seriously was in 1964 when I'd finished my third year here at Harvard and volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project. And the Mississippi Summer Project was an effort to support the, uh, the work of African-American organizers in Mississippi, the most racist state in the country at the time, and um, in, in challenging the barriers of segregation, political rights, and so forth. But organizers in the, uh, black organizers in Mississippi found uh, they'd either wind up uh, beaten or in jail or worse, and so the idea was to try to bring people who the law did cover to Mississippi in the hope of bringing the law to Mississippi. And so that's why many of us from the North were recruited to go and join in this effort. And we were in a training session in Oxford, Ohio, about 300 of us the night before it was time to go. And we got word that three of our party had disappeared, uh, Michael Schwerner, Andy Goodman, and James Cheney. They had gone down a week before, went to Meridian, Mississippi, been sent to Philadelphia, Mississippi to investigate the burning of a black church where civil rights activity had been going on, and they hadn't been heard from since. Now, Bob Moses, appropriately named, who was the lead organizer of the whole effort, called us together in an auditorium like this. And uh, he was a soft-spoken guy, and he delivered this news. He says that, you know, our three brothers are, are uh, have disappeared. We don't know what happened, but we think we do know what happened. We think they're gone. And sure enough, two months later, their bullet-riddled, beaten bodies were found buried in a dirt levee where the Ku Klux Klan had taken them after the sheriffs turned them over to them. Now, we didn't know that at the time. But Bob said, look, <coughs> I can't take all responsibility for, for this. Uh, I would like to tell you just go home. Forget it. But I need you to go. And so everybody here has got to decide. You decide not to go, that's fine, that's no shame. But I need you to go. Well, that's one of those moments that you sink into your seat and it was utter silence in that room. And you begin to think, what the hell am I doing here? Is this what I'm, you know, angled for? No. So I began to reflect my own experience. My father was a rabbi. We lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War. And as a child, I've met people whose lives had been shattered by the horror of the Holocaust, trying to find hope somewhere. But my parents interpreted it to me as not being simply about anti-Semitism, but about racism and that racism kills. Uh, it's, uh, you turn people into objects, anything can happen. Anything, you can do it, anything. As a rabbi's kid, I don't know if there's any preacher's kids here or whatever, oh, there's one, what kind? Um, what kind of pastor. Huh? My dad's a pastor. Of what, what denomination? Fiscal. All right. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, we got it. Um, it's a, it's a, you, you have to go to all the stuff. 
you know, you have to show up at all the things, you know, the services and all that. You're also supposed to be perfect, which is a different set of issues that we're not going to get into right now. Uh, but I love the Passover seders. I love the telling of the story of the Exodus with food, which was cool. But they would point to the kids and say, you were slaves in Egypt. And I say, excuse me, I've never been to Egypt. I've never been a slave. It took a while for me to figure out that what that meant was that that story is not the property of one people, time, or place, but is told generation after generation. And you kind of have to figure out, are you with those guys with the chariots and the horses, or are you with those people who are trying to find their way to a land of promise? The civil rights movement spoke this, told the same story, literally the same story, about the Exodus struggle in Dr. King's account. And finally, it was a movement of young people looking around the room that I was sitting in. I mean, I was 20 at the time. People were 18, 19, 21. It was a movement of young people. And Walter Brueggemann, the Protestant theologian, wrote a book where he said, prophetic imagination or transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two elements. One he calls criticality, which is a clear vision of the world's hurt, of its need, of its pain, coupled, he says, with hope, a sense of the world's promise and possibility. And young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find in almost of necessity hopeful hearts. And so for many of us, that's what drew us to the civil rights movement. So as we're sitting there in the room, a young woman named Jean Wheeler stood up in the back and she began to say, they say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, we struggled so long, we must be free. They say that freedom is a constant dying. We've died too long, we must be free. And as she stood up and began to walk out of the room, everyone filed in behind her. And the next day, everyone went to Mississippi. Now, that was a life-changing moment for me because encountering Mississippi was to, with all due respect to Harvard, where my education about race, power, and politics began in America. And it was very clear that the inequalities were so clear, uh, but it was also clear that bringing a few medical supplies or books wouldn't change very much. That, that's when we began to learn the difference between charity and justice. Charity says, what's wrong? Let me help. Just says, justice says, why is it happening? Let me change it. And when you begin to ask those questions, you make people uncomfortable because you begin to discover that these people don't have over here enough because these people over here have too much. And so then you are in a struggle. And it's a struggle to figure out how people can turn their resources into the power they need to change things. That's what organizing is about. And the civil rights movement discovered it in the Montgomery bus boycott when people realized that they could use their feet to walk to work instead of getting on the bus. And by doing it long enough for a year, they could turn individual dependency on the bus company into collective power. Now that was a very exciting discovery. I got hooked on it. Instead of coming back to school, um, you know, I actually wrote Harvard a, a letter saying, how can I come back and study history when we're busy making history, which was pretty arrogant, but also, <laughs> but it was also true. Uh, and so I, I went back to California where I grew up. Uh, I'd grown up in the middle of the farm worker world, never seen it. Cesar Chavez had just started a grape strike of migrant farm workers. It turned out that there was another community of people of color also without political rights, also without economic protections. And California with its own rich history of racial uh, discrimination beginning with the native peoples, with the Chinese, the Japanese, and so forth. So it turned out that Mississippi was not an exception to America, but an example of America, and the example, I mean, an example of the America we needed to change. So I began to work with Caesar, did that for the next 16 years, where I learned the craft of organizing another 10 years, union issue and electoral work, was then invited to my 25th reunion here at Harvard. I'd never come to a reunion. For some reason, I came to that reunion, ran into a 20-year-old version of me, said how it's going, asked me. I said, I'm feeling stuck. 20-year-old me said, come back and finish that senior year. I said, my synapses may not work. Uh, I talked to one of the deans. We dealt with the fact that tuition had changed a little bit in the intervening period. <laughs> and, so, and so in 1991, it came back, finished my senior year in history government, wrote a senior thesis, graduated class 64-92. Uh, and, and my 81-year-old mother got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate, uh, which was an important loop to close. Then the Kennedy School for a master's and then a PhD in sociology. So I've been on the faculty here at the Kennedy School full time since 2000. And I was asked to teach a course on organizing which turned out to be critical because it was a way for me to integrate my life experience with social science in a pedagogical conversation with a rising generation. 
So for me, it was like twice a week, you get to go and have a conversation with the future. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. And so it's a mutual kind of learning experience. And then through my students was, was called back into the world of action, beginning with Howard Dean's campaign in 2003, uh, the work with the Sierra Club after that, and then the Obama campaign 2007, uh, and so forth. So where this whole approach to, this is where this whole approach to public narrative comes from. In other words, it comes from experience, it comes from social science, most of all, it comes from practice. And it is a way of engaging practice thoughtfully and purposefully. So let's get right into public narrative uh, and how it works. The starting point, oh, I have to show you the starting point, okay. The starting point is that when I was doing organizing, there was always this, this we were always focused on strategy because um, we were always David trying to deal with Goliath. And so when you don't have the resources Goliath has, you have to be more resourceful. You have to be smarter, you have to be more creative, you have to be more committed. So strategy was very, very important. But you can have a great strategy and nobody shows up and guess what, you don't have such a great strategy if people are afraid and divided. So there was always this second dimension of motivation that was equally, if not more important. And so whenever we would do a campaign, we would have a story, we would have a strategy, and we would have a structure, sort of the three elements there in order to get that together. Well, when I came back to school, I discovered that uh, uh, psychologists had studied this, Jerome Bruner in particular at the Ed School here, uh, had studied the different ways in which we map the world. And we map the world cognitively in terms of where things are in it, which is very helpful for finding our way from here to there. It's how to answer the question, how do I get from here to there? How do I, it's, it's the efficiency side. But if we want to understand why I care or why anybody cares, you can't get there from that. So there's a second mapping that we make of the world which is affective or emotional. We attach emotional value. We attach that which inspires, that which frightens, that which, which causes despair or disgust, that which lifts us up. And it's that second mapping, that emotional mapping of the world, which is where the domain of values is grounded. Because values are not intellectual ideas, they are what actually moves us to act. St. Augustine said it's one thing to know the good, that's fine, but loving it is what enables action upon it. So knowledge does not equal action. And so the emotional dimension is really where the whole work of values is. And if we're gonna talk about values, then we have to come up with a way to communicate about emotional content. You know, we have over here the whole side of logical arguments and so forth, it's very good on cognition. Doesn't do so much on, on why we care, why others care. And so it turns out that one of the ways in which we, one of the languages, you know, Pascal said the, the heart has reason of which reason does not know. One of the languages through which we communicate information about values is narrative. And that's what we're gonna be exploring a little more specifically. But the, the significance of emotion for leadership right here is, um, well, most of the time we're on autopilot. We operate out of habit most of the time, right? And, um, you know, so I'm driving, and it's very efficient because otherwise I'd have to learn how to, re, you know, relearn my car every time I get in it. So I'm driving along, I'm on autopilot, everything's fine. A uh, truck pulls out, I stay on autopilot, uh, not so good. So our brains have developed what's called a surveillance system to detect anomaly, surprise, the unexpected. So my brain detects the truck and it's going truck, 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 and I experience that anxiety, and it's a good thing, that anxiety, because it calls my attention to the fact that habit will not do. So that's helpful. Sometimes the leadership challenge we face is to, this is gonna sound weird, is to create anxiety. In other words, to find a way to counter the inertia and apathy that goes with habit with counter emotional capacity. Urgency is one, you know, the deadline. You know, uh, you know it's gotta happen now. Um, I have a decision to make about my whole future, but tomorrow I have a problem set. What do I work on tonight? Problem set. Urgency will always displace the important. 
One of the challenges is to connect the urgent and important, and that's a big challenge the climate change movement has faced for, for some time, is how to make something so important urgent enough that we experience its urgency. Another is anger, and by anger I don't mean rage, but I do mean outrage. I mean the sort of thing, uh, the sort of thing we're experiencing daily every time you turn on the news and you hear what the latest Trump Trumpification or whatever you want to call it is, frankly. I mean, there's a kind of uh, moral violence in a way. And, and, it, and it produces outrage. And it ought to, because it's a contradiction between the world as it is and the world as it ought to be. And that tension can be powerfully creative of action. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about anger. That tension that becomes a resource for courage and for action. But let's say you do a great job of making everybody anxious. You got everybody anxious, great. Um, what's the default from anxiety? You're feeling very anxious, so then what does that easily flip into, turn into? You betcha, you betcha. You know the old uh, fight, flight, uh, or freeze and hope it doesn't notice you, whatever it is, and goes by, right? Now, that was very functional. That fear reaction when we were dealing with saber-toothed tigers, that was very, very functional. You know, uh, yeah, uh, fight, uh, probably not. Flight, most likely. Freeze, maybe. Now, but once we started to live in communities with other people to react to every unexpected event, every surprise, every potentially threat threatening event uh, with fear becomes profoundly counterproductive. So we began to learn ways to access the emotional capacity to respond as opposed to react. In other words, how to counter the fear with access to hopefulness, to counter the isolation that goes with fear through access to empathy, with the sense of self-doubt that goes with fear, with access to a sense of self-worth, or what we call ikmad, you can make a difference. So the challenge becomes in leadership sometimes how to create the urgency, but on the other hand, how to counter the fear with hope. And by hope, I, I don't mean flowers in May. I'm not talking about optimism. I'm not talking about, hey, every, everything's good. Maimonides, the 12th century scholar, had a very good definition of hope. Uh, it's a little complicated. He says, uh, hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. Now, what he's saying is that to be a realist is to recognize that while it is always probable Goliath will win, Sometimes David does. While it was utterly improbable we would elect a black man president of this country in 2007, it actually happened. And we know in our own life experiences of those moments of possibility. And that sense of possibility for me is where hopefulness is. And, and cultivating that sense of possibility that we're not prisoners of probability. And of course then empathy or call it love to counter the the uh, isolation and the sense of self-worth. So now what does this have to do with narrative? Well, let me tell you. So, all stories have three elements. They have a character, a plot, and a moral. Uh, you don't get a story without that. Now, uh, what's a, what makes a plot a plot? Um, I left my office, I walked over here, I began talking. Is that a plot? I mean, it's very exciting. I mean, you want, to, you want to pay to find out what happened next? You, make it a plot for me. Turn it into a plot. Make it a plot. The saber-toothed tiger out here, just outside here? Oh my God. <laughs> so then what happened? You're being followed by spies. <laughs> Wait, so I got a tiger in front of me and I got spies behind me? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I won't ask who's spies, but I, yeah, but, yeah, so then what happened? I ran away. And so, but then how did I get here? How did I get here? Come on. The tiger leads the spy. Oh, -ho, this is good. <laughs> this is very good. This is very good. So yeah. I, I, yeah, I stepped out of the way and, hey, dinner. And so they went after the spies. That's very good. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and, and they were so satiated, they fell asleep, and that's how I got here. That's kind of interesting. I mean, usually I, I want to make it 
so that the Khaleesi comes on her dragon and saves me. <laughs> but, but we didn't have an opportunity for that in this story. Uh, sorry about Game, Game of Thrones. But what's the, what's the point here? When, when does the thing get interesting? A problem. See, not necessarily even conflict, but a problem. An interruption in the expected. You know, you're going along on your way to wherever, and boom, something happens. That's when we all lean forward. That's when we get interested. So why? What's at stake? Why does that call our interest, whereas before, it's boring? Why? What's going on? Yeah, but why? Why do you care? But why do you care? You're not in danger. You don't know what's going to happen. So what? It's not you. I mean... Yeah, but why do you care what I'm going to do? Because human beings care about other people. Well, some do, and <laughs> not everybody that pays for all the movies and books and novels and plays and songs that are all structured in the same way. Gives you another, gives you another strategy for the future. So next time you're confronted with a saber-toothed tiger and spies, you'll know exactly what to do. You have a good plan. Watching somebody else. Yeah. All right, look. How, ma how many, no, I mean, everybody sort of got it. I, I mean, how many times does the unexpected happen to you every day in little ways? I mean, the movie's sold out, or there's no seats left, or whatever it might be. And then there's big ways, right? People lose jobs. People get thrown out of school. Marriages break up. We lose loved ones and we, and we, that we can't be prepared for losing, but we have to deal with it. Isn't it the case that one of the critical dimensions of the human experience is to have to deal with the unexpected, to deal with that by definition for which we cannot be prepared. And we seem infinitely curious to figure out how to do that. Now, because we can identify with a protagonist, and we, we now understand this works through what's called mirror neurons, that when we observe somebody doing something, we can actually experience elements of it as if we were doing it. So when we identify with the protagonist, we're actually beginning to experience where the protagonist went, what values, sources he or she drew upon, where they get their hope, what the fear was. And so what we're learning is how to deal with that, not in a tactical sense, but in a much deeper way. And so the moral that a story teaches is not like haste makes waste, it's the experience of haste making waste. And that experience becomes part of our experience. The experience of the protagonist becomes part of our experience, so the moral that a story teaches is to the heart, not just to the head. Does this make sense? I mean, think about where did you hear your first stories? From who? Yeah, so, so what were they, why were they telling you all those stories? I mean, to keep you busy, I have maybe, but... <laughs> no, Bruner found that 85% of the time parents spend with young children is in storytelling. Why? Why? But now think, parent, uh, people here that have kids, why do you tell those stories? It's instructive, isn't it? You know, there are stories like, let me tell you about Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie started out great. <laughs> but then he took a wrong turn. And you don't want to be like Uncle Charlie. Now, Aunt Harriet, she had it right. That's who you want. Every family has those stories all over the world. That's why our faith traditions teach through stories. That's why our cultures teach through stories. They are experiential. They have experiential emotional content, and therefore they become a resource, an emotional resource or moral resource for us. So this is kind of where the power of narrative lies, is that capacity to communicate hope, to create empathy, to enhance a sense of self-worth, to find values that sustain us and communicate those. Now, public narrative is a way of trying, of harnessing the power of narrative to the work of leadership. And it's a way of, of harnessing that first through what we call a story of self. And the story of self it draws on moments of experience because the core element, the, the basic unit of narrative is the moment. It's a moment of experience. I don't know if people saw Michelle saw the Democratic Convention last summer and Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton, Clinton. Michelle Obama speaks entirely in narrative moments. 
you know, the thing with the big, the black cars and the guys with guns, and she's talking to Barack about what are we going to do, or waking up in the White House, a house built by slaves. Every one is a moment. Hillary couldn't share moments. And so we couldn't get the emotional content of what was going on. So the moment is the core unit. So a story of self is about reflecting on moments through which you learned what you care for and where you get your hope. What's your values? Where did your values come from? You know, and it's not like this thing about like, well, I always knew that I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. Oh, you came out of the womb with a little atom sign here or something. <laughs> no, it's experience teaches us that. But it's, it's accessing those ex <coughs> experiences to be able to communicate to others why we're, what we're, why we're called to what we're called to do. Why, why I'm here trying to exercise leadership. What got me here? A story of us is about how to use shared experience to bring alive shared values in those whom you hope to call to collective action. It's not a categorical us like everybody with green hair. It's an experiential us of shared experience. And the story of now is how to make, use narrative to make real a challenge, the challenge, an urgent challenge to those values that requires hopeful action now and a pathway to that action. So that's the self, the us, the now, and how they all work together. So it's not just a story of self. So what we're going to do here is um, take a look at an example. And uh, this is um, James Croft, who was a student in the public narrative class about four years ago. And um, the final assignment in that class is students uh, record a five-minute public narrative that includes their self, their us, now. It's called a linked narrative, a complete public narrative. So uh, when you take a look at this, see if you can tell when is he telling a story of self, when is he telling a story of us, when is he telling a story of now. That's number one. Second. Ask yourself why he chooses the moments that he chooses around which to build the arc of this story, okay? The specific moments, moments of challenge, choice, outcome. Those are kind of the, the moments. Third, why the details? Why the details? And fourth, what are the values then that are experienced or communicated through the story? Let's take a look. 6.12 seconds. That's about how long it takes to fall 604 feet. And 604 feet is about how far Tyler Clementi fell after he jumped off the George Washington Bridge. Now, as we know, he took his own life because live video footage of him having a romantic encounter with another man was streamed live on the internet by his college roommate just one of a very long list of young people who have taken their lives because of anti-LGBT bullying in the past few weeks. Now, I never experienced anything like what Tyler went through when I was at school, but I was bullied for being gay. You see, when I was a kid, I was a ballet dancer, and every week I squeezed into a leotard and blue shiny hot pants. It was uh, quite an outfit, and I spent an evening practicing demi-pies and pirouettes. And I loved it. I loved the discipline. The music played on the old piano. The feel of the wood beneath my feet. I even secretly quite liked the outfit. <laughs> but my schoolmates and some of my teachers didn't like ballet as much as I did. And one of my teachers, a PE teacher, used to make fun of me. He used to say how girly I was, how dancing is not something that a boy should do. I remember the sneer on his face as I walked past. And I remember that he was the first person to call me a fag, which at seven years old, I didn't really understand. I remember in high school how gay was only ever used as a term of abuse. And I remember one cold morning sitting in assembly while the principal intoned, homosexuals deserve our pity and our prayers. And I sat among hundreds of other boys thinking I was all alone in the world, and that I was the only one who had this problem. Now, not everyone may have experienced something like that, but we all know, I think, what it means to feel alone, to feel like there's no one on our side. Perhaps you were too tall, 
and the short kids made fun of you. Or perhaps you were too short and you got it from the taller ones. Or perhaps you were too smart or too dumb, or from the wrong side of town, or the wrong race. We all know, I think, even if just for a moment, what it feels like to think that there's no one on your side, to think that no one has your back. And all of us, if there are young people in our lives that we care about, can agree that we don't want this to happen to them. Imagine, if you can, what it must be like to come home and see a strange shape hanging from a tree in your backyard, twisting in the wind, the creak of the branch as it bends beneath the weight, and that feeling in your gut as you get closer and you realize what it is hanging there, who it is, who it was, because that was Seth Walsh, 13, who hung himself from a tree in his backyard. It was Billy Lucas who hung himself at his grandmother's house. And it was Raymond Chase who hung himself in his door. And it could have been your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or your friend. It could have been one of us. So I know, I, I only came out in March this year after 10 years, 10 years after I first told my parents that I thought I was gay. And in those 10 years, I lost a lot of opportunities to make a difference. I was a high school teacher, and every day I wasn't out was a day I deprived a gay student of a positive role model. And I'm not willing to waste any more time. I have to act now. We have to act now. Because it isn't enough to let these things happen and then mourn them afterwards. We need to catch these kids before they jump. And there is something we can do to help as a start. Journalist Dan Savage has started a campaign, the It Gets Better campaign, to send messages of hope to teenagers who are being bullied because they're gay or for whatever reason, that they should have hope for their future, that they do have something to live for. And I think that if we made such a video, as Harvard students with glittering careers ahead of us and sparkling degrees, then we could make a difference. So we need people to hold a camera, to share their stories, to do editing and sound, to stand in a big group and say it gets better. No contribution is too small. And if you want to get involved and you're an undergraduate, talk to Tevin here. Do you mind waving? Oh, hi. And he'll tell you how to get involved. And if you're a graduate student or if you just want to come along from 5 to 7 p.m., in the Elliot Lyman room in Longfellow Hall at the Education Schools campus, stand up and say, we're standing with these kids. We've got your back. Let's catch them before they jump. Thank you. So what did he start with? Story of self, story of us, or story of now? Well, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Why now? Anybody, why now? Yeah, yeah, the now is about confronting us with the reality. Now suppose he said, we have a problem of suicide. What's the difference between that and what he did? Could you see it? Could you see it? He's showing, not telling. See, this is all about showing, not telling. Storytelling is all about visualization. I mean, our capacity for episodic memory, which is what enables us as a species to tell stories, is, is connected to our capacity for visualization. So visuals and other sensory content makes this much more emotionally accessible to us. So he starts with a now. And then where does he go? Where's the first moment he goes to after that? Yeah, but which one? What's the first moment? Ballet dancing. So why does he go to ballet dancing? Because it's, it's an instrument. It sort of engages the, the audience. He, he brings them to this moment where you know, everyone's able to relate to their, their vulnerability, their fragile. But how does that... expands it. But what, what sense, though, do you get of him from the, from the story about ballet? What sense do you get of him as a person? Well, but you haven't heard the struggle yet. See, he's going first. To, yeah, I mean, what, what are the colors? What's the images? What's the sounds? Do you get a sense of joyfulness in that? 
See, he's not going to be an iconic victim. See, he's going to be a person who is capable of joy, capable of celebration, capable of, of beauty. So that's where he takes us first with all those images of color and so forth. So then what's the next moment? Not yet. What's the next moment? All right, the, the gym teacher, right? Okay, how does that make you feel, that moment? Sad or angry? Yeah, certainly. I mean, and again, can you imagine it? Can you picture it? And then what's the third moment he goes to? What's the next one? Huh? Where? Yeah, what's going on in high school? The principal comes out, he's in with all these kids, and the principal comes out and he begins to feel like totally isolated and cut off. So he, he starts with a kind of joyful moment and then he has these two moments of contrast. You begin to understand why he cares about this issue, experientially, not through some philosophical argument. But then where does he go after that? Well, but so what's, what, what story is he going to? So how does he get to a story of us? How does he get there? How? But specifically? What have we all felt? Isolation. See, it's very interesting what he's doing there because he's taking what could be a very narrow issue and turning it into an experience broadly accessible. And so we begin to understand not the whole content of it, but we begin to experience some capacity for empathy in terms of what, what he's talking about. And so then he, now, once he's got us into the us there, and because see, the meaning a story has, it's based on the story as presented, but the story then evokes memories of our own and our own stories and our own experiences. And so the meaning that we experience is at the intersection of those two. And so that's what he's doing there. But once he's got the us there, then where does he go next? Not yet. Where does he go next? Not yet. Ah. And yeah, exactly. So now we're there. Now he's taking us home. And what do we see? Now, are these data points hanging from the tree? They have names. They have parents. These are human beings. Now, confronting that image, does that image have any resonance in American culture? With what? Yeah, you know the Billie Holiday song, Southern Trees, Bear a Strange Fruit, Blood at the Leaf, Blood at the Root, Black Body Swinging in the Southern Breeze, Santa Magnolia and the Poplar Trees? Now, he doesn't have to say all that, but he, through the image, he connects the injustice narrative that that image is part of to this one. And he doesn't have to say it. So now he's confronted us with the now again. And then where does he go? Where does he go next? Your brother, your sister. Well, he's got it's all part of the now. Where does he go next? Come on. Where? What? Not yet. Not yet. He's got to go somewhere else first. Is there any hope in this story so far? No. Not a lot, huh? Ah, oh, okay. He goes back to the self. And why does he go back to the self? Huh? But, and, and so, but, huh? Okay, so there you go. So he was a high school teacher, right? Now, you know, think about this for a minute, like leaders are supposed to be invulnerable, right? Aren't leaders supposed to be perfect? They never make mistakes. They're always strong. Is that so? Here he's up calling people to leadership and he's beginning by, by announcing a screw up. He had 10 years and he could have done something, he didn't do it. Of course, does anybody relate to that in your own lives? Well, I'm afraid so. And so then he reports that he has. Isn't that where the hope begins in the story? He's capable of change. Oh, maybe we're capable of change. Maybe the world is capable of change. Just simply by, by that.
And so it makes an interesting point about the relationship of vulnerability and courage. Is there courage without vulnerability? You know, it, it's kind of like, I mean, the whole point is that you, you've confronted challenges, you've made mistakes, that's what's the foundation for the fact that you have something to teach us, something to learn. One of the, another reason I like Moses is that he's so flawed. So there's so much to learn. What do you learn from a perfect person? Oh, I, I need to be perfect. That's great. Thank you for that lesson. It's really, really helpful. No, it's instructive. And so there's a deep connection between vulnerability and courage and leadership that is often really missed that I think is central to what he's doing here. So then where does he go? Now he's got, we're, we're more hopeful. And then where does he wind up? Yeah, and uh, is it the most world-shattering action? No. So what is, what is hopeful about it? It's feasible. Huh? It's feasible. It's feasible. What else? It's something this group, specific group can do. Something this group can do, and what else? It speaks directly to the problem. Speaks directly to the problem, and it can be a beginning, not an end. I mean, see, what's really important is that it is very... The opposite of this would be to say, okay, everybody go forth and be kind to gay people. Hey, a lot of calls to action end with that, or the equivalent. I mean, I'm making fun of it, but I, the equivalent. So go forth and be a good person. Well, that's not leadership. That's not strategy. That's exhortation. So unless there's some focus to a goal, to some strategic action, and a shared purpose at that, then from my perspective, it doesn't pass the leadership test. You know, at the end of The Inconvenient Truth, the Al Gore movie is like 43 things you could do to help the environment. You trivialize every single one. Do people do them? No. But see, we're hung up on this idea, oh, we gotta give people lots of choices. Well, what we do is just, just create insignificance. The challenge is to open a pathway that could be significant that could make a difference, whether in a small way or a big way, but something that's plausible. See, people get confused and think that people volunteer their time because it's easy. You know, yeah, you know, give an hour a year and change a child's life. Well, first of all, nobody believes that. And it, it, it's, we commit our time and energy and effort when we think it will be valuable when we think it actually would have consequence, when it would matter. Because any time we take from our time, our precious time, and commit it to something, we don't do it lightly. So the test here is one of that, that it is significant and it is accessible. And you can make the ask right then and there. OK, so this is all you got to do for public narrative. All set? <laughs> Five minutes. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, see, when, when we learn this in the class, you learn to tell your story in two minutes. Story of self. Story of us, two minutes. Story of now, two minutes. And then you get to put it all together in five minutes. This is five minutes shared from James. There's something about showing and not telling, about focus on images, that is where the craft of this, of this work is. This is a craft a public narrative. And it's learning how to do that. The thing about it is everybody can learn this. Because, I mean, hasn't everybody, hasn't everybody here told stories? We're, all, we're hardwired for it. So what we're doing is, is taking the implicit and making it explicit so that you can bring intentionality, craft, and purpose to it. And, you know, it's not about packaging. It's not about marketing. The first year I taught this class, somebody Somebody said, oh, I see, this is about how you brand yourself. And a woman from India, Jyanti Ravi, said, no, no, this is not about how to apply a gloss from the outside. It's how to bring out the glow from the inside. And that's where this craft is, and that's what this craft is really about. Now, we want to focus on the story of self, because that's the starting point, not the ending point. Now, story of self um, is... Uh, how many people find it really easy to talk about themselves? Oh boy, there's an exceptional person. She's going to have a seminar afterwards. You can kind of, kind of talk to her. 
what is it that we're so reticent about? Huh? Oh boy, yeah. But we don't we say, I don't want to be a modest, right? So I don't want to toot my own horn. And I mean there's a lot of the point is that that in public life, you have no choice. See, we had a, a candidate ran for president a few years ago, John Kerry. People may remember that. Yeah. <laughs> he could never tell his own story. He had a great story, he could never tell it. So who told it for him? Swift voters, the opposition. See, either you claim authorship of your own story or others will. And that's the deal. So then the question is to learn how to tell your story. And it's a matter of drawing on those moments and experiences that you can share, that others can begin to see you and establish. It's not resume, you know, it's not, uh, it's not titles, it's experiences. So people can get you. See, in a story of us, you're trying to get them to get each other. In a story of now, it's about getting the urgent moment. But in the story of self, it's about getting you. Why are you here doing this? What do you care about? So, I don't know. Let me see. Um, hi. hi. What are you doing here? Um, <laughs> um, I'm part of a... Oh. Um, I'm what's, a member, what's, what's your name first? My name's Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Uh, I'm a member of a political organization. Um, and... I'm a leader in that political organization. You're, being, you're coach right here. You got a coach <laughs> right here. That's good. Um, What's a political organization? Oh, uh, indivisible. And so, why are you part of that? Because I'm committed to. Well, I'm committed to racial justice organizing. And when did you get committed to racial justice organizing? In high school. What happened in high school? <laughs> I started. I was with Amnesty International, and I started paying attention to. Wait, wait, wait. Now, where was this? Just located. I was in New Hampshire. Okay, what town? Chester, okay. rural, pretty rural. New Hampshire. And this is a public high school. Semi-private. Semi-private. Ninety-nine <laughs> percent white. Okay. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, I started reading articles about the women in Juarez and Chihuahua being murdered. Oh yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. um, I was. Also, at the same time, on Howard Dean's campaign as like a 17-year-old doing phone banking, and I, there was a lot going on in my well, life. Maybe that's where we met. <laughs> no, <It might've> been. <laughs> I don't think so. But yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just started becoming aware of the great injustice. Um, well, let, let me understand. Uh, so you grew up in Chester, or where? I grew up in Chester. And what did your folks do? My mom is a high school teacher, and my dad works in sales. In sales. Mm -hmm. And you went to public elementary school or private school or what kind of school? Public. And so where did you get this concern about the women in Juarez, or wh where did that come from? Um, I mean, if I were to boil it down and look at like the very beginning, yeah. um, I have my uncle is black, and I have two cousins who are black, and they this also. This is on your mother's side, your father's my side. My mother's side. Yeah. My um, my aunt married a black man. Uh huh. Um, and they. How did you How did you first hear about that or learn of that? Uh, he. I was very young, and t they started dating. Yeah. Um, and. Was I, there commentary on that around the house? No, not in a negative way. Yeah. Um, no, he just was a, a man that my aunt was dating, and I loved him. He was a basketball player, so I thought he was really cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How old were you at the time? I was probably five, six. All right. Very young. Yeah, so then what happened? Um, I, I mean, life was normal. I just loved them. They're my family. Yeah. As I got older and started becoming aware of things, How they all... I'm sorry, go ahead. They also lived in pretty rural New Hampshire. Um, uh, so I started becoming aware of racism that they, my how cousins did, How were. did you become aware? Um, just... Um, what happened? I mean, were there, was there particular instances or moments where somebody said something or... I have an uncle who is, uh, who is racist. <laughs> yeah? Honestly. Um, so what happened? He him? just always treated them differently. You remember the first time you observed that and saw what was happening? Yeah, actually. Um, what, what was it? 
I was at my aunt's house and my cousins were over visiting and my uncle was yelling at, at my cousin Jalen and he never yelled at anyone. Like he adored me and my sister yeah. and would never have yelled at me. And, and Jalen wasn't doing anything either. So it, it was just the first moment where I was like, this isn't right. This, it felt very, it just felt wrong. And how did you make sense of that? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. And yeah. not until, I mean, I talked to my family members and my, my immediate family, family and members about it later. What did they say about it? As I was older. When you talked about it with family members. Um, I mean, my immediate family agrees with me. <laughs> but, but I mean, so you said, why was he shouting at your uncle? And they said, or I don't know, I'm just asking. Yeah, I mean, I never talked about it with anyone till later. And oh, really? Yeah. Um, so it just stuck with you as, what, a moment of what? Unfairness, injustice. Because mm. you loved your uncle. Yeah, I, I loved my cousin. I love my cousin. Yeah, cousins. your cousins, yeah. Yeah. And so then what happened next? Then how did you begin to act on this? Um, I mean, I didn't do anything when I was young. Right. Um, so when's the first time you started doing something? High school. What was it? Um, and Amnesty International. And why was, Amnesty? Uh, I mean, it was 2000 is when I started high school, so the Iraq War was happening. There was a, a lot going on. Um, I, I was committed to pacifism, and it, that When, when that was, did you get committed to pacifism <laughs> here? Where'd that, where'd that come on the picture? Uh, the, the, the Iraq War, yeah. It was like George W. Bush and... and all of that. But how did you, so how did you find your way from that first experience you described, which is a very important experience, it sounds like, mm -hmm. to then what seems like a much broader commitment to a broader set of concerns? I'm just curious how that. No, I know. It's, I, I don't even know how to link the thing. I mean, just, I mean, I'm, I'm a upper middle class privileged white woman. Yeah, but and so what does that explain about why you acted? Because it just seemed unfair that I could live in a world in a certain way and that other people couldn't live in the same world. Yeah, but wh where does that idea come from? <laughs> really, there's a whole lot of people in this country that don't believe that for a minute. Uh, I, oh, I'm so what totally about you? aware. So, 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 yeah, I bet you are. So, so, so where do you get that idea? I mean, your experience is real, but where do you get that idea? I mean, my parents had a big role in it. I, were you raised in a faith tradition? or the, I was. I was raised Episcopalian. Yeah. Um, I mean, was it active? Was it real for you? It was. Yeah, yeah. I, had a, I had a pastor, who I, a reverend, whom I really connected with. And what was his name? Or? Her name was Miriam. Yeah. Yeah. And you had conversations with her? Yeah, yeah. I had confirmation class. and. Oh, so you were confirmed. You went through the whole... I did, yeah. yeah. You threw yeah. the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, well, that stuff certainly has some meaning. Mm-hmm. And so your first activism, though, was? My first actual activism, I guess it depends what you call activism, but I gathering signatures for, probably, for the women in Juarez. That was the first. I remember I was in a... And that my, was in high school. Was in, yeah, I like stood up on a table in my cafeteria and was like, <laughs> gathering signatures. And people just looked at me like I was this big weirdo. And, yeah, and so where did you get the courage to do that? Um, Googling, I don't know. I was just like so angry. Yeah. I was just I was outraged. I yeah, was you so, were outraged. I was outraged. Yeah. And so. And you and you thought you had to do something. I did. Yeah, I did. I felt like I had to do something. Well, that set you on a path, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Ashley. <laughs>
Very often, we normalize experiences that we've had that have profound influence on us. But we sort of say, oh, I was always. But there are real experiences there. And the value of retrieving them is that they, 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 they shift from being influences on us to becoming resources for us by deepening our own self-understanding and being able to communicate to others the significance of those kinds of experiences. So the questions, the probing questions, the why questions, a lot of questions about early times, because early on is often how we learn about what we care about and where we find hope. And so um, that's what this coaching stuff is about. So there's telling the story and then there's coaching others. And when we teach the class, we do a workshop, people learn to do both. Because the more that you are able to coach another, the better able you are to understand your own. And see, the way this works is you can get really good at it just by coaching each other. Because you have, I mean, who, who in this room has experiences of hurt? Yeah, and who's got experiences of hope? See, if you didn't have the hurt, you wouldn't think the world needed fixing. And if you didn't have the hope, you wouldn't think you could. So everybody has in their experience a repertoire of experiences to draw on that can be of value to others in terms of not just their understanding you, but learning through your experience. Does this make sense? So this is, this is what the story of self-work is all about. How are you doing? Are you okay? I'm good. Uh -huh. Did, did, did it feel like I was interrogating you? No. W why? Because that probably a lot. Of, probably a lot of people thought. Why? Why? Um, I trust that there is compassion behind it, so I didn't feel like interrogating. How was was compassion signaled in some way? Um, oh boy, the mic again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you were smiling. Yeah. Making eye contact. Yeah. Um, it. it yeah, tone of voice. Did I seem really interested? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to fake. It's hard to fake interest. See, what, it's not an interrogation if there's some sort of empathetic relationship. Even, I mean, not, we didn't have a whole, you know, we never had a one-on-one -on -one or anything. And I really did not meet you in 2003 in the Dean campaign. <laughs> no, no, but it's sort of uh, being genuinely interested is actually what we then experienced. I mean, how many times a day do we have somebody ask us serious questions that cause us to think that's really interested? You don't get that very often. So in, it, it's important to break out of thinking it as, as intrusive when it's actually enabling. But it takes some courage to do that. So what we're going to do is, oh, I, yes, I, one other. <laughs> You know, I, um, there's a Yiddish riddle. Um, who discovered water? You know the answer? Oh, that, that would be very practical. That's, that's good. <laughs> no, the answer is, I don't know, but it wasn't a fish. Now, that's supposed to be funny. But, no, but, but it makes the point that we are all fish in the water of our own stories. And so, you know, it's like those things we've normalized or naturalized. And so it takes an interlocutor, it takes someone asking us those questions that, that doesn't, hasn't assumed all that, that can help us recover and find and those kinds of moments. So that's one reason coaching is a critical piece of all this. And so what we're gonna do is share with you um, a, a video, short video on the do's and don'ts of coaching pre uh, prepared by Sarah el -Rahib who is my head teaching fellow in public narrative, and her team. Uh, and they're going to uh, show three examples of how not to coach, and then three examples of how to coach. So let's take a look at this. First time aired publicly. So this is a very exciting premiere uh, <laughs> of uh, coaching public narrative.
Um, okay, so Anita, I'm gonna give you a 30 second signal. This is a one minute story, so whenever you're ready, you can start. Um, so it was my first ballet recital. I'm four years old and I'm in this little pink tutu with pink leotard and my pink shoes, and pink was my favorite color when I was four. And when they said go, Oh man, I went and I was the most graceful butterfly you've ever seen and I glided across the room like we'd been practicing. And I landed at my brothers and my mom and they were all smiling and clapping. And my oldest brother, Rajiv, who was like my hero in the world, you know, he smiled and he said, you were such a good airplane, zoom, zoom. And he was joking, but my little butterfly heart just broke because I realized that what I thought I was wasn't actually what the world was seeing. And so in that moment, I just decided that I didn't want other people to like feel that what they were wasn't being able to be shown. And so I went into teaching and education to help everyone discover their little butterfly spirits and, and fly free. Um, Anita, that was an amazing story. I feel like when you brought us in at the beginning and you talk about all the pain, like I can imagine you as a little girl. And when you said my little butterfly heart just broke, like I just felt so connected to you um yeah it was just a really really incredible story thank you so much for sharing thank you yeah i don't think you need to change a thing i was really really compelled um i wanted to know a little bit more about the recital so who else was in the class with you how many other students they're probably like oh gosh like 12 or 13 they're all in their little pink tutus and yeah it was really cute actually okay and were other students also butterflies in the recital we were all supposed to be butterflies oh okay yeah did the other students like pink as much as you did um i don't know if they i loved pink like, yeah i really loved pink. yeah I got everything that. in my room was pink like yeah i don't know if they loved it as much but okay so you but you really did oh my god it was my favorite okay i wanted to know what was the challenge that you faced in the story um I think like when my brother said I was an airplane. That was your challenge? For sure. Then what was your choice? I, my choice to quit ballet. And then what was your outcome? Well, I wasn't a ballerina anymore, I guess. Okay, great. So you have challenge, choice, outcome, great. And that's our time. Um, not really sure what to ask you. Um, I, I really like the part about your brother. That was my favorite part of the story. So if you could move that to the beginning, like make that the start, and then um, put the part about the recital in the middle, and put like how many students were in the recital with you. Oh, okay. So if you make those two changes, like make sure Rajiv is at the beginning, I think your story would be a lot better. Awesome, thank yeah. you, that's super helpful. Yeah, no problem. Oh man, what was that? What you just saw were three really bad examples of coaching. In the first one, all that Anjali did was tell Anita everything that she did well. Did that help Anita to make her story better? Absolutely not. She's just stuck in, wow, everything I did was perfect, but she didn't actually answer any of the questions we had answered when we coach. In the second example, Anjali was just asking really random questions. Why does she need to know about the color pink? No one knows. I'm not sure. So we don't want to get stuck in asking broad, vague, or unrelated questions. We want to make sure we have a strategy when we coach. And then in the third example, Anja decided, you know what? First she froze. She didn't know what to do. And sometimes when we freeze, we default to giving advice. And so she just started making statement after statement after statement around what Anita should change in order to make her story stronger. In Anjali's opinion, not Anita's opinion. And so what we're about to watch is a good example of coaching. Good coaching does a few things. The first thing that it does is it affirms what worked in the story for the purposes of that person retaining that knowledge and keeping it in future drafts. Then the coach has one strategic intervention. Is the coach gonna coach for the challenge that the person faced, the choice the person made, or is it the outcome? How that relates to the work that they do today. Then finally, the coach should always end with a wrap up. What is that person taking away with them? Or what are questions that that person should continue thinking about as they go into the next draft of their story? So let's watch this and pay attention to how Anjali prompts Anita on what she should be looking for and how she asks questions to get there. Let's watch. Um, thank you, Anita, so much for sharing your story. I, I really appreciated the moments um, when you said, my little butterfly heart just broke. I felt so connected. 
Um, but you said you became a teacher, and I didn't hear a choice point, like when you made that decision. So I wanted to hear when you decided to become a teacher. Yeah, I think, I feel like I kind of fell into teaching. So mm-hmm. my brother that I was talking about in the story, he he passed away when I was a sophomore in college. Oh, wow. Well, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, but he was living in Spain, and so I ended up just wanting to like connect to him in some way. So I lived in Spain, and then I started studying Spanish, and I found that being in that environment somehow felt more connecting. So when I got back to New York, I ended up teaching English to these Spanish-speaking immigrants. Okay. And I think that's how I like, fell into teaching. And you decided, oh, so you fell into teaching, mm-hmm. but you continued teaching. Yeah. Why did you stay in it? Um, I think, so I didn't know what I was doing when I started teaching. I'd mm-hmm. never, like, been a teacher before, so I used to just go and trying to get them to talk, I would actually, like, tell my stories a little bit. Did you start that on the first day, telling <laughs> your story? So I used to watch this show when I was younger called Mind Your Language, and the teacher would, I don't know, I think they sat on the desk, and I, so I would sit on the front desk, and I was, like, telling stories about, you know, like, where I lived and leaving things behind and stuff like that. And in class, then students would, like, share their stories about loss and change. What do you mean leaving things behind? You shared stories about leaving things behind. Um, So I moved around a lot when I was growing up. And Mm -hmm. so I think talking about that in hopes that they might also share about, like, the countries that they had left and their pasts. Did students respond to that? Did they open up to you? I think... Who do you remember opening up to? I remember, like, Carlos from El Salvador used to talk about his daughter who he had left back home and how hard it was for him to be there. Did he tell you that on the first day after you shared? Uh, Probably not on the first day, but maybe like pretty soon. I remember like within the first, you know, couple weeks. Do you remember what he shared with you? you? You said he talked about his daughter? Yeah, he had left her, his daughter was like 14 and he had left her in El Salvador with his mm-hmm. wife. And he was just working and sending money home, and it was. But he was saying it was so hard to be there. Mm-hmm. But he liked coming to class actually for that reason, because it was like a chance to be with people. What did it feel there. like for you as a teacher to hear him open up and then share things like that? Um, I think it was really special, and maybe for me, it was also a way that I was like healing myself in mm-hmm. the process of like somehow creating this community that other people were sharing and healing. So it was healing for you and for your students. I think so. It felt like that. Okay. Is there other, are there other moments where you felt that sense of this is a healing experience for my students? Yeah, actually. So Gonzalo, who was my student, he was 80 years old from Colombia. Mm-hmm. And he, I ended up going to this AA meeting with him to practice my Spanish and listen to it. And he gave me this plaque commemorating 40 years of sobriety. Wow. And he put it in my hands and said, you, my teacher. And I just remember that moment realizing the impact that I had, like, created something so special I'm gonna for him. So pause you there. When you bring us into these moments, like hearing Carlos open up after you opened up, having Gonzalo give you this plaque and realizing your impact, to me now I know here's the moments that connect to why you decided to stay in teaching. Mm. So if you can bring us more into those moments, um, I would try to do that in your next version of your story of self. That's really helpful. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much for sharing. What did you think of the video? I mean, you're the premier audience. You're hearing, <laughs> seeing it for the first time. Would it be appropriate to applaud or, or, or boo or? <laughs> no, they, they spent about seven hours on Sunday uh, putting this together to try to make <clears throat> as much of the experiential work of public narrative coaching accessible. And so, yeah, so what, what do you take away from that? What did you learn from seeing that? I mean, it was rather well commented on in the course of the whole video. But uh, any surprises in that or what do you think? Yeah. Because when you're coaching, it's important to explain now we're gonna, we have limited time. See, when we do this in a workshop, there's two minutes to tell your story and there's three minutes for feedback and coaching. So you explain, there's limited time and so I'm going to interrupt to bring focus. It's not, dis- it's not meant any disrespect and it's sort of like setting the ground rules in terms of what to expect. And then it's fine. I mean, I did some interrupting over here, I think. And so it's because when you have, you're trying to coach to two minutes, and when you're trying to coach and you have limited time, if you sort of just talk as long as you want, then also we do coaching in groups, and so others won't get a chance for the coaching or the exercise. So it's sort of being clear about what the ground rules are in the beginning of how, how the thing will work. It's a good point. What else? 
What else did you see in this? Yeah. How easy I can see the don'ts are. Like, I <laughs> that a lot of the don't questions um, are things that I do all the time, like give advice and, you know, un, like questions that make no sense. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was helpful to realize those are things I shouldn't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the don'ts. Uh, I mean, the, the core idea of coaching is what? Is it to give advice? I mean, who here has been successfully coached by somebody? So, so what, 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 what did it consist of? Huh? Some questions. Why? Why questions? Why not advice? Why? Makes you think. Makes you think. What else? Help connect the dots. Yeah, and what else? You can discover your own truth. Say more about that. That sounds very profound, but I want well, you. <laughs> it, it, it gets. The, the, your own experience of what you generate um, from the question, it's true for you, it's, it's you own it. It, yeah. it. I didn't get it from you, and yeah. I didn't get it from Ashley, and yeah. it's my experience of whatever that is. And so it's ownership, and it's also, um, if you give somebody advice, you just say, do this, what, what she was doing there, what are they gonna do the next time they have a challenge? You just created a yo-yo. In other words, it's like, gonna come back, gonna come back. The whole point of coaching is to be developmental. In other words, it's to develop the capacity of the other person. And you don't develop the capacity of the other person by, by just telling them what to do. You develop their capacity through a process of discovery and of developing the muscles, the muscles that are developed through inquiry and questioning and paying attention so that they then can do it. Does that make sense? I mean, that's a core thing in coaching. And so learning how to, when we teach coaching by itself, we have an exercise we do where it's just, uh, you have to help somebody with a leadership challenge by only asking questions, no advice allowed. And for some folks, it's like silence for a while. <laughs> but then you, you sort of shift your frame from how, do I, from how do I tell this person to how do I enable this person? And we say leadership is about enabling others to achieve shared purpose. That coaching is a practice of leadership, in fact. And in this context, we're coaching public narrative, we're coaching stories, but coaching can be applied in, uh, in just so many different settings. Let's just take a, a few minutes for, uh, just from the whole time that we've spent together, the, the, the discussion, the explanation, the James Croft, the, um, the uh, work with Ashley, uh, this thing on coaching. What, what are your takeaways about public narrative and, and how it works? Yeah. What struck me from both the video and your coaching? Uh, what struck me is that everybody has a deeper story. Yes. Uh, and that we tend to tell a more surface story the first time around. Uh, but with someone who can stay with us and ask some good questions in an empathetic way, we get down to something that has a lot more emotional resonance to it. Yeah, amen to that. Amen to that. What else? What other takeaways? Yes. Following on, uh, following on the previous two speakers, uh, you really helped us understand the difference between the facts of the story, which I think is what you were saying, and the story. Mm. And that's where the authenticity and the mm. credibility comes mm. in the public connections. That's a great, that's a great uh, distinction. Sometimes we distinguish between telling a story and telling about a story. In other words, actually recreating the moment of experience is telling the story. Telling about the story is, when I was X age, this happened. And so it references a moment of experience but it doesn't bring the experience into the present and therefore the other person can't experience the emotional content of the story and they can't experience you because you've distanced yourself. So that's, what else? Yes. Um, it uh, feels very empowering because it centers the emotion or the motivating factor. Um, yeah. It centers the, Motivating factor where? I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, you're on a good um, run there. Just 
you know, when you were doing the back and forth, yeah. you were asking questions, and you know, like this person was saying that people have a deeper story. Um, so I just felt that getting to that core part or that motivating part was very empowering when often folks feel bewildered or yeah. incapable because they don't have the strategy. Yeah. And so often when you're looking at the emotions, your emotions, like you said, if you feel anxious about something, is often telling you about a need. Yeah. And so there, I think that there's a lot of people in the world that gripe and have feelings about things that are going on in their day-to-day -day reality, but they uh, think that they don't have the strategy. Yeah. And so exploring if somebody's personal story often they can find the thing that needs to be done. I'm glad you remembered what you had to say. <laughs> no, no, really, no, that's so important. Because if you're, if you're feeling more hope with more capacity, you're much more likely to come up with a good strategy. When you're feeling disempowered and you're feeling despairing, it's very hard to be creative and think strategically. So these, these are very much inter, interrelated. What else? Other, other takeaways, other interesting points? Yes? No? You have to have the courage to be vulnerable yeah. and, and not keep our shields up. Yeah, it's crucial. It's really, really important. Yes? Oh, right here. Thank you. Today I learned to uh, how to create my own powerful narrative because before I only had an emotional antenna to understand what narrative worked or not, but today I learned a structure which ah. means that I can replicate and develop my own as That's well. Great. That's great. That, that's exactly the idea, the scaffolding there. Anything else? Yeah. Back, yeah. That you can't give advice on somebody else's story because only they know the story. <laughs> yeah. You'd have to just be making things up. That's interesting. Other takeaways? Yeah, right there. Yeah, let's, folk, let's especially folks that we haven't heard from before. Yeah. So, <laughs> I still am not sure in how many questions is too many questions and when do you reach the point where, you know, is asking one, one more question might kind of break the focus of the story and you're not basically distracting away from that, for the main takeaway. Yeah. We all think we have a story or we all think we don't have a story. And the questions help to a point, and then maybe one more question, and you no longer believe in your own story. Well, it's interesting. That's an interesting notion. I mean, all of this is judgment. I think we tend to be more fearful to ask probing questions than we are ready to ask them, because we think of them as being intrusive. And, but the probing questions are what really where the learning is. You know, sometimes we say, well, I wouldn't be comfortable with X, and usually when people say that, I sort of think, oh, well, that's where there's some learning to be done. You know, it's like, well, it's like one of my students, we're, there's a lot of talk about safe spaces. One of my students said, we don't want a safe space, we want a brave space. We want a space in which our courage is supported to step up and to, you know, find our way through the vulnerability so that we can learn. And I think that's a lot where it is, but it's a judgment thing. And so, yeah, you can go too far, you can not, but, but you learn that only through practice. There's just no other way. And your own, you know, your own uh, values of what you're trying to do, I think. But it's a, it's a good and interesting question. I think we need to um, conclude this part of the program um, because there is a part of the program right after we conclude for purposes, I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying this or not, but what, what, for purposes of the video, we are going to stay and give you a chance to actually practice this stuff. Are you interested in that? Yeah. To actually practice, yeah. to practice with each other. All right, then we're gonna do that. So what I'm gonna do then now is point out what comes next. I think I'm ready to relinquish control now. Yeah, um, and this is for, for those here as well as others at home. Um, there are more uh, resources for story of, both for story of self and for story of us and story of now and for linking at, at the uh, www.resistanceschool.com. And the resources are examples of those stories and then examples of how to coach those stories with our same brilliant coaching team. So those are accessible and can be used. So. Um, 
I want to thank you all for your attention, your engagement, your energy, your risk taking. Uh, let's just have an applause for Ashley over here. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude here with um, a lesson about how to applaud. Uh, when, when I was uh, with the farm workers, um, uh, a guy named Luis Valdez came to us who, who did Teatro Campesino and brought music and theater and so forth into the movement. And uh, he asked us to applaud. And just applaud. And he said, you know, you're trying to build a movement of solidarity, of momentum, but you just applaud chaotically, you know? It, it doesn't communicate who you are. So he said, I'll teach you how to applaud. And it was like this, join me. Now for many years in California, that was known as the Aplauso Campesino. And any place you heard that applause, people said, oh, it's the farm workers. But I was doing a Latino Camp Obama in New Mexico in, in the campaign, and a young woman organizing the Filipino community came and she said, you know, we don't think that has enough solidarity to it. Really? Oh, so join me. Here's what we, what we added. That's it. It's getting the last one right. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Oh, oh what happens now? Speak for a second. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, don't go away because we're going to do this other part. Professor Gans, <laughs> take your seats. One second. <laughs> thank you. Professor Gans, thank you so much for giving us a better understanding of what it means to tell our own story and the impact that emotional connection can create on the many critical social movements of our time. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Quick studies here. <laughs> uh, so through sharing our own narratives, we can reclaim, rebuild, and reimagine America in protection of our progressive values and our democracy. So thank all of you at home also for watching tonight. At the close of this session on our website, we'll provide additional coaching, videos, uh, homework to practice your narrative, and online readings to continue to build on what we learned here tonight. These resources are intended for you to practice your narratives, find your voice, and mobilize for the change you want to see in your communities. We also encourage you to continue motivating and activating other groups in your communities. Uh, we can't do this alone, and these tools are meant to be shared. Our videos will be available online to rewatch and to host additional training sessions in your community. If you're eager for more trainings, you don't have to wait very long, because next Thursday on October 19th, you can tune in at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to our partner, Resistance School at Berkeley's Facebook page to listen to the great Robert Reich train on cross-cutting messaging in a tough political environment. Also, Resistance School will be back October 26th with a training on relationship building. So stay tuned. We'll be announcing the trainer here uh, momentarily. Thank you again for tuning in. Please like us on Facebook, share our page and our videos with your friends, and remember that you are the change that will reclaim, rebuild, and reimagine this country. We believe in you. Thank you. <laughs>